Okay, it's 9.30, so let's go ahead and get started. We have a taker of minutes. Thank you very much, Jonathan Hoyland. Very much appreciated. All of you should bow down to Jonathan. That's, um, yes. Uh, this is the note well. Uh, hopefully you're familiar with it by this time of the week, but if not, uh, these are the policies under which we operate and uh, th that apply to you, especially regarding things like intellectual property rights and code of conduct, uh, for example, anti-harassment procedures and so forth and so on. If you're not familiar with this, take some time and look up on your favorite internet search engine, IETF Note Well, and you should find something that looks like this. So today, uh, we have two sessions in this IETF. Today, uh, we're going to uh, talk about the active drafts that we have in process and a few other topics. Uh, we have resumable upload, the templated connect CCP, the unprompted authentication, uh, structured field values, revision, uh, and the retrofit structured fields in a brief uh, sideline into the query method, followed by an update on the status of alt service, uh, a report from the WebSockets design team, and a proposal for a header called request OTR. Uh, then on Thursday, we have just other topics, which we can go over then. But for today, do we have any agenda bashing, any changes, additions to that? And can everyone hear me okay? In the back, I see nodding in the back. That is good. Okay, we really have to eat these mics then. Okay. Any uh, other uh, uh, agenda bashing? Chris, are you agenda bashing? No, okay. All right, then let's go ahead and get started. I will attempt to stop sharing this. How do you do that? This button? No. That's just kind of laggy. Yeah, it's laggy. OK. Um, so and how do I share slides here? Um, it's the document one. It will have you uploaded slides? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Are they on this preference? Yeah. OK, so then it's that one. This one? I might just share this my screen. Like, yeah, I might just share my screen. Um, and Jonathan, if, if you could also um, drive slides from his device too. Yeah, um, my machine is super laggy right now for some reason. No, it's the machine. Okay, sorry. One so second. I can help you in just a second. Let me get this going first. Machine is dead. As soon as he shares his screen. The wrong part said, my machine's dead. We're having technical difficulties. Please stand by. Here oh, we go. Did you do that? Okay, fantastic. LTE for the win. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead, John. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Good morning. Uh, my name is Jonathan Flat from Apple, and today we'll be talking about the resumable uploads draft. Uh, so there are several open issues, uh, and there will be time kind of after each of those issues to open the mic and discuss. So feel free to get in the queue whenever. Uh, and let's begin. Next slide, please. Cool, so uh, first off in the past few months, uh, there's been some new implementations of the draft. Uh, there's the TUS.NET server built on the .NET framework. Uh, there's the Neo resumable upload package for Swift Neo and URL session client on Apple platforms. Um, since the making of these slides, also one of the authors, Marius, has done a lot of great work in compiling and also creating 
uh, more client and server implementations that follow the draft and logging their interoperability. Um, he sent an email to the working group yesterday, I believe, with a link to that repository. So if anyone's interested, I highly encourage you to check it out. Next slide, please. And uh, in implementing these servers, we made an observation that there's sort of two uh, ideas of how to approach this. Um, one is the additional service takes this idea of a resumable upload, handles all of the resumption for you, and then passes the complete upload to your backend service. And another one is where the resumable upload protocol is kind of built or wrapped around your current backend logic, um, feeds all the data straight through there, but also handles the resumption. And so maybe not right at this moment, but perhaps in chat or offline, uh, we'd love to get some feedback from those with backend integration experience, um, maybe some recommendations on uh, how, what we can recommend to server providers when implementing a protocol such as this. Next slide, please. So our first open issue is the upload complete header field. And the current draft uses upload incomplete as both a discovery mechanism and as a way to do a potentially more advanced option of chunked resumable uploads. However, uh, upload incomplete false or a double negative often leads to confusion. So the proposed idea is to use upload complete instead. And there's already been some discussion uh, in prior meetings about this. Um, and it's, uh, I think one of the points was that there's a slight difference between upload complete for the client versus for the server, but also this symmetry allows us to echo the field on success in this uh, successful case. So next slide, please. Um, one of our questions to the working group is can we lock down upload complete as the preferred name or, uh, are there other ideas, other thoughts on this symmetric versus asymmetric naming? Um, we'd love to hear your feedback on this if anyone has comments or questions. I see a thumbs up, multiple thumbs up. Does that count as a general consensus? <laughs> awesome. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, our next issue is on multi-version support. So currently, the draft uh, details how a client sends the draft version it supports. If the server supports that version, then it advertises resumable uploads. However, as the draft evolves, we can imagine a case where a client might update to the newest draft sooner um, and a server that they were previously talking to for resumable uploads that has not yet updated, uh, the client loses the capability to perform a resumable upload. And so can we make this transition easier? Or, uh, next slide, please. Do, do we want to make this, like, is there interest in solving this multi-versioning issue? And also, uh, if so, do, do other people have uh, more insight or experience on draft versioning like this that they would like to uh, comment? Uh, Kazuho, if this is an issue, I think my preferred way of solving this would be having a suffix for each header being used. I, I mean, like for upload complete draft three or something, because then, I mean, having a different name of header it's a general way of us extending HTTP rather than having a version number field next to a different header field. Awesome, thanks. Yeah, I wouldn't worry too much about this at all. Um, I know that we've changed semantics in the previous slides, um, but that was a complete header change to Kazuo's point, and that'll be fine. Uh, are you aware of any reason that this might need to change? Um, the answer is probably no. Um, but if we do need to change it, then we can talk about spelling something differently. Um, we can drop an E from complete or something like that. Um, <laughs> things like that, right? I, I don't yeah. think, we, we could spend a ton of time engineering this. 
and I don't think that's really worth worth the effort. Okay. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Um, yeah, that's good feedback. Thanks. Cool. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, our next issue is on adopting byte range patch. Uh, so byte range patch is a draft that's uh, going to be called for adoption in the HTTP API working group. Um, and how we would adopt this in the draft would be uh, eliminating the need for the upload offset header field by using this byte range patch. For instance, upload offset of 50 becomes uh, content range bytes from 50 to some known number if you know the content length, else uh, you can use the indeterminate 50 to uh, whatever form. So this could reduce the number of headers uh, because we could also remove upload offset from the offset retrieving procedure. The server could, for instance, just respond with a content length, which semantically um, could make sense for a partial upload. So next slide, please. Uh, so overall, what are our thoughts on adopting byte range patch, but also do we want to depend on another draft in another working group? Because um, this dependency could uh, come into play with different timelines. Watson Lad, Akamai Technologies. I think byte range, regardless of the merits of byte range patch, my understanding is that that's a little different than this case. Here we're talking about an upload. We've got one file. We're just moving it to the server. And what we want to have sort of server side is we don't care how many times it got resumed. We just want to see it when done. Supporting byte range changes is always more expensive than, a, or a lot of the times it's more expensive than appending, particularly in some exotic storage architectures, or if you have some implementation where you're moving the file at the very end. So I think we should probably not depend on it just for the difference in semantics we want to express. Thanks for the feedback. I think in the draft, uh, we would specifically be using it only for that appending case um, and not uh, patching like multiple ranges throughout the file. Uh, but it would be more of a semantic change in how we say we're doing that. I believe we have maybe some. Yeah, yeah Austin. Austin, um, and I, uh, yeah, I'm doing the byte range patch thing. Um, I'll see you on Thursday um, if you're going to be in the APIs working group. Um, the for depending on the draft and another working group, I'm hoping that we can push this through fairly quickly. Um, like I'm not sure there's too much more to evolve in it. So if we can push it through as in like an RFC. Um, Hopefully, then that shouldn't interrupt the work here much. As for um, the feature set, uh, I think one of the benefits is that um, because it specifically numbers, we're going to modify these bytes. Um, the server can properly process messages that may rece be received out of order or things like that. Or it can actually verify um, that if it receives a resumed upload, that there's not content that's missing in the middle that would just get silently corrupted um, if we otherwise didn't specify we're starting or resuming the, the upload at this byte offset. Um, and then the other benefit of the byte range patch is it also does specifically enumerate where the end of the upload or the expected upload is. So you can actually verify, ah, um, we are expecting 500 bytes and we've received 500 bytes, therefore the upload is complete. Um, and that you can eliminate that upload complete header that way. Um, and you can know this in that way. You don't have to know if the upload is complete or not from the start of the request. That's something you can figure out at the end of the request. Um, there, there are a number of different forms and media types. You don't have to support all of those. You can just say in this spec, you know, it, it's an error to do this or that, or you can just ignore that behavior. There's shouldn't be any conflict there. Um, but I, if there's any further questions on that, um, we can definitely. I definitely like to hear the issues um, because like uh, one, one of the motivations for this media type was actually specifically a basis to do resumable uploads. So thank you. Yeah, yeah. thanks for the info. Um, I think the upload complete header field would still be needed for discoverability. And I 
believe still the decision between chunked and incomplete, but maybe we can follow this up uh, offline or on the issue. Um, I think there's other people in the queue. Uh, Apple. I think uh, I've looked into adopting Brightrange patch. I think the uh, first I have a concern, like uh, it's changing the syntax of the content range header, which might not be compatible, uh, deployable, I'd say. And uh, also it's currently, we are de debating between adopting, dropping upload complete or not. And the, the problem is if we drop it, uh, the current replacement storage is not that great. We, we end up needing to further chunk it into uh, either multi-part response requests or into this binary format, which is sort of also multi-part. Mm, uh, I'd I like to flush that out more before we uh, think about adopting this byte range. Thanks. Tommy Jensen, Microsoft. I, I don't think the benefits of having the additional data that that provides outweighs the fact that then if we're still supporting the upload complete header field for discovery, now there are two ways to express where we're uploading to and I dislike ambiguity. Thanks for the feedback. Eric Nigren, Akamai. I'm um, just kind of echoing some of the previous comments. But I think one thing on the your response um, to Watson's, I think if we were to use a patch, we would want to be able to cover all the cases. Having having something that says, well, we're using patch, but you can't actually um, use it for these cases. You only have to use it in this kind of subset of ways. Would seems like it would be um, result in a lot of implication and implementation ambiguity and bug potential. Um, so if if so, we'd probably want to if we were to do that, take on the full complexity. So, um, of those cases and therefore might want to take that full complexity into a do we really want to do that switch. And I think the intermediate, I think it's part of the content range one, like thinking about how this interacts with intermediaries and how many kind of inter intermediaries would just keep work, would keep working um, versus would need, would need substantial changes to support the content, um, content length on, on, on post, post stuff might be another consideration. Yeah, that's great feedback, thank you. Um, do we have more in the queue or maybe we might want to move on? Uh, One more, I think, Marius. Yes. Okay. Marius. Um, yeah, hopefully you can hear me. Um, so as I understood it, the, the draft from Austin includes like multiple parts. One is, for example, that it has content range also now defined for um, writing or modifying requests, um, but also like the new media type. And may, if we decide like the media type isn't really the thing that we're looking for, maybe it's also um, suitable to just say, okay, we want to reuse content range and therefore avoid introducing like a new header field um, upload offset. Um, so maybe if the entire draft doesn't work out for us, we can also just like pick the parts that um, suit us. Yeah, thanks, Marius. Well, I was getting in the queue to channel Julian's comment from Zula, but I see Julian's in the queue now, so I will defer to him. Go ahead, uh, can you, hello? Yes. Ah, good morning. Uh, I just wanted to point out that the semantics of HTTP patch absolutely require us to have a media type. We can't just wave hands here. So even if it's something like uh, application slash append, we will need to define that type if we don't use something else. Thanks for that reminder, Julian. So, so, so there's no way to use patch without a media type. That would be undefined. Yeah, that is a good point. Thank you. Um, yeah, let's take uh, further discussion maybe to the issue or the zoo. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, another open issue is uh, perhaps more of like a feature addition, uh, upload progress via informational responses. The use case of this or the idea of this is after the initial 104 response, the server can send additional informational responses with the uh, upload offset or the number of bytes that it's successfully stored and saved. And this might allow a client, for instance, to release data associated with the upload uh, from before that offset. So my question, quick question is, should this 
be included in the draft? Is there ish interest in it? And uh, if so, maybe how much or in what way? Tommy Jensen, Microsoft. Um, active disinterest, given some of the experiences we've had with intercompatibility with 100 responses, just generally speaking. That's good to know. Thank you. Answer a couple, Rodrigo. Um, I would generally be in favor of something like that in order to, you know, have a mechanism for clients to observe progress, um, even, you know, while a certain chunk is uploaded in terms of monitoring and detecting, probably calculating speed of the transmission. So I, I would find that helpful. Thank you. Uh, well, so generally speaking, servers are allowed to send 100 uh, uh, informational responses at any time, any number of them. So it would be, I think it would be kind of awkward to prohibit uh, sending them at some cases. So I'm in favor of taking this proposal. Oh, yeah, thank you for the feedback. Um, Marius. Um, yeah, sorry for the brief cue. And one thing that we don't have to think about if we reuse the 104 for this, or if we have to like, because it's like, I think the status code is, then to like indicate that resumability is supported by the server. And if we can just reuse that for that, or if we like actually need a new uh, 100 response code for that, um, but that's something to figure out probably. Yeah, so I'm hearing that there's like some interest, some direct disinterest, um, but we would need to kind of figure out how much should be included in the draft in terms of a recommendation. Um, does anyone have ideas on that? Or perhaps we can also take it to the issue online. We'll take it to the issue. Next slide, please. Uh, the last one is an open issue, not in this working group, but in the what working group. Uh, and it's more of just uh, to note, uh, Marius opened an issue uh, asking for feedback on the draft from those folks and also as an API proposal uh, for fetch. Um, so something to note, it was labeled needs implementer interest. So if uh, anyone's active in the working group or maybe potentially interested in implementations, uh, feel free to check that out there. Thank you, next slide, please. And this is our last slide. Uh, it lists just some of the other open issues. Um, some of these are uh, have come to more or less of a consensus or maybe even have PRs open, um, but we can take the time to uh, address any comments or questions from these or any other parts of the uh, presentation. All right, um, then we'll give some of the time back to the next presentations. Thank you all. Great, and thank you very much. Uh, next up, we have uh, Templated Connect TCP. Okay. Hi, uh, I'm Ben Schwartz at Meta, and this is Template Driven HTTP Connect Proxy for TCP. Or uh, really, as a reminder, what we're talking about is basically mask for TCP. So. Uh, HTTP Connect is a long-standing way to move TCP through HTTP. This is a variation on that idea that aligns with the mask template-driven proxy system. And so you can see there, the proxy is identified by a template, which tells us how to construct a request in HTTP2 and HTTP3. That's extended connect. Uh, in HTTP 1.1, that's uh, via the upgrade mechanism. So. I, this draft is very simple, and uh, yeah, I think it's pretty stable and close to done. Uh, there's a little bit more text needed, like a security section, and uh, we really it would be really great to get some implementation experience. But it's it's really a, a very simple idea. The one interesting change since the since adoption, since the last time we talked about it 
is a new text about false start and zero RTT, which were uh, requested by Tommy Polly, I believe. The, uh, so the, for background, conventionally with a TCP proxy, you would have to do whatever TCP and TLS setup you need to do, and then you'd need to send a connect request to the proxy and get a confirmation, and then you could start sending your payload. Um, so the, with, TC, with TLS or quick zero RTT, if you're doing a resumption, that you can skip some of that. And with uh, the false start we're talking about here, to be clear, is not, uh, not TLS 1.2 false start. The false start is, a, is, again, terminology borrowed from MASK, where you might want to start sending upload bytes before finding out if your HTTP request succeeded with the understanding that if the request failed, then those bytes are not going to reach the target. <clears throat> and uh, that is now documented and explicitly allowed in this, in this draft. Whereas for classic HTTP connect, it was sort of not very clear whether it was allowed. Uh, Martin. Okay. So um, we're not talking TCP fast open, are we? That is, I think, orthogonal. Yeah, I see Tommy shaking his head and going, yeah, uh, that would be a bad idea, I would, I would suggest. If, if you like things breaking, um, by all means, enable it. Um, but I think false start is probably a bad term to be using in this case. Uh, it, it's quite misleading. Uh, okay. Uh, I'll make, make a new one. All right. Well, this is, David just said, um, does he mean TLS false start? And, and, and like, no, um, because that doesn't make any sense in this context. Um, this is mask style false start. Um, yeah, is that a thing in, in mask? Did we make that mistake there? It does not call it false start. Okay, good, good, good. Find a, find a new terminology, that's all okay. I'm asking. Mike Bishop, Akamai. Um, I. I don't know that we ever had a term for this, but the H3 spec did have to have additional language around connect saying that it's weird in that you have to handle the request on the headers and then process the body after you've opened the tunnel. And I think that's really all you're talking about here, that the client is allowed to send the body while it's waiting for response. Yes, that's exactly right. Yeah. Okay. Uh so noted, we will find new terminology for that. Um, the reason I mentioned that, this is my last. Uh, there's oh. a little bit more of a cue, Kazuho. Oh, okay. okay. Right, so I think doing uh, false start is fine for HTTP2 and HTTP3, but I wonder if there's any security issues with uh, doing it over HTTP1.1. Yes. And maybe we have to write that down. Indeed. Oh, sorry. Very prescient. Um, I, I'm impressed. Uh, Kazuho, Kazuho figured out that problem, uh, you know, about two months faster than I did. <laughs> uh, is there a more cue? Yeah, I, I was just going to mention for terminology, um, we can take this to the issue too. But in the Connect UDP mass stuff, it just talked about it as the client sending it optimistically. So you can just talk about like optimistically sending the data, the body data. That might be it. Oh, okay, way to say it. Okay, yeah. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what appears in this draft currently, but it will definitely try to match the mask terminology. So uh, I, I wanted to highlight one that exactly Kazuho's point here, which is that this is all well and good in HTTP two and HTTP three. In HTTP one point one, this gets a little weird um, because if uh, according to RC 9110, the server is allowed to say, no, thank you, I don't want to upgrade. In which case, the bytes that follow are uh, continue to be HTTP 1.1 rather than whatever the upgrade protocol is, which to me strongly implies, although it's not quite explicit, that you're not allowed to do this kind of optimistic transmission in HTTP 1.1 with upgrade. And so that's what this draft currently says. It says, thou shalt not. Um, Connect UDP, but like, so, so on the one hand, we'd like to be consistent with that. On the other hand, it would also be good to be con consistent with Connect UDP because that's, that's the parallel thing for this draft. 
Connect UDP is, uh, has a little bit of a different take on this. This says the client must abort the connection if the upgrade fails. So that's a little bit different, maybe a contradiction with uh, the HTTP 1.1 spec, which says the server is allowed to deny the upgrade. It's not exactly a contradiction. The server is allowed to deny the upgrade but, and then try to continue speaking HTTP 1.1, but then the client is definitely going to kill the connection. So that's a useless thing to do. Uh, also, Connect UDP says that the client can optimistically start sending packets before receiving the response. So that sounds like this optimistic transmission is allowed. It doesn't explicitly exclude HTTP 1.1, although I, you could argue maybe it's implicitly disallowed. Uh, but if it is allowed, then there's this like potential for some very weird stuff here where like you could have request smuggling due to disagreements about like what protocol we're speaking. Um, I don't really have a strong opinion. I have some bad ideas in red here, but um, I just would like to uh, close this out and uh, find out what, what people think the right answer is. Yeah, this is really bad. Uh, I, think, uh, I, I think abort the connection is a, probably a mutual re uh, requirement here mm -hmm. in, in this case. So um, un unfortunately, the server's not really in a position to know whether the client's waiting or not um, when we're talking about uh, HTTP 1.1. Uh, so concretely, the client sends the connect request to the server and the server rejects it. Uh, if the client was waiting on the on a positive affirmation before it started sending right. data, then potentially it could say, "Oh, I saw the uh, rejection. I can make another request to this." Right. Point. And and by the way, you know, as noted here, that's actually a pretty common situation because if you have your 407 proxy authentication required, that is the flow that you're going to go through. Right. Now, I'm not sure that that's really a good situation to be in. Um, overall sort of holistically uh, because it means that you don't get to do the optimistic sending thing. Uh, it's also possibly the case that the, um, uh, if you allow for that possibility, the fact that you assume the client's waiting um, for a response before it continues, and this is how everyone expects HTTP 1.1 connect to work, then 92.98 has a bug in the sense that um, it, it probably shouldn't have allowed optimistic sending. Uh, on the other hand, the other way we could approach this is say that if you see a connect attempt, then that connection is gone no matter what. Mm -hmm. And we, we treat that as, an, uh, as uh, whether, whether it succeeds or not, the connection is, is e either successfully upgraded or the connection is now no longer usable from the perspective of either side. Um, and then that creates an obligation on both the client and the server to abandon the connection if, if the rejection occurs. So the one thing that seems odd about that is that uh, if you look at the HTTP 1.1 flow here, there is no connect request. Right. There's a get with an upgrade. Mm, yeah. And, and if that upgrade, upgrade token is unrecognized, for example, then the server is in HTTP 1.1 land where it's supposedly allowed to, to reject the upgrade the and keep the socket open. Uh, I believe that the understanding there was that the server would reject, would, would ignore the upgrade and answer the request. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. Either way, it continues to speak HTTP 1.1, which means that the payload then is going to be interpreted as HTTP 1.1 for this proxy, which again, yeah. puts us back in request smuggling. Uh, yeah, because one of them has a content length that you pay attention to, and the other one doesn't. Wait, who designed these protocols? It was no way <laughs> well, you all used get on this stuff, so I think you painted yourself in a bit of a corner here. I, I, I think that Mark points out that a, a good, good point in that there's a, some usage of this and it is limited to get, which means that the, the HTTP request doesn't have anybody. And I think we've just created that, that same problem that we just saw. I think we probably need to do some updating of some RFCs. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is gross, but um, I don't see any other way around it because it, like the, just the, the, the published RFCs all contradict each other in ways that create security problems. So, so but there's that, that seems to imply some breaking changes. It's called job security. 
Uh, David Skenazi, Connect UDP enthusiast. Um, so speaking as the uh, editor for that document, um, the intent there was that it would be possible to send data, like, you know, your, so your UDP, sorry, your datagram capsules with your get, that's an upgrade that would then be sent as UDP. Um, in practice, I'm not aware of anyone actually using Connect UDP or H1 or anyone ever planning for doing it. So it's not that, but my main point here is I'm not sure this attack matters. So like either you have a server that supports Connect UDP uh, and it knows what's going on and let's say it gets a request for it and, or, or this, you know, and it doesn't like it it's going to shut down that connection. Um, and if you get a server that's never heard of this, that's when you get into the world of, they might misinterpret things and request smuggling. But like this attack where you have capsules that are, that actually spell HTTP things, it's very clever, ugh. Uh, like that presumes that you have an evil client. No. It presumes that you have an evil traffic source behind your client. Well, the tra if, if your traffic source is UDP, that's only sending capsules with zero. Right. Like so, so, yes, capsule type number 2559 uh, or uh, whatever is, is not currently registered. If that were registered in IANA as a capsule having a meaning that was relatively commonplace, then a local traffic source could potentially exercise it. And so my proposed solution here in red for you is to change our IANA registration rules so that any confusable capsules are unregisterable and therefore we can never have this problem. Yeah. Uh, speaking as one of the designated experts on that registry, uh... Uh, no, but specifically, like, there's no such thing as a Connect UDP client that's going to take input from an arbitrary source and just shove it into into any capsule. Like, uh, Connect IP. Are... Connect IP, I would argue, is essentially that, right? Connect IP in a system tunnel configuration, except essentially arbitrary IP datagrams generated. Yes, uh, but that uses the datagram capsule. It doesn't use, there is no point, at least in any of the implementations I've ever seen, that lets you shove in custom capsules from something untrusted because yes. custom capsules could be bad regardless of this. Right. So this only applies if capsules with confusable types are registered in as having a meaning like, oh, this is a capsule with this particular DSCP byte. Uh, value that's registered in IANA as having this value. And now I can trigger that from an untrusted source. All right, I'm starting to see what you mean. I think that's kind of too far fetched for us to want, want to fix it, honestly. Maybe a note on the, you know, for implementations, don't allow this kind of crazy thing, sounds safer. So uh, it, it sounds like we're not going to resolve this today and we're running at time. So I've closed the queue and if the remaining folks in the queue could be relatively brief. Hey, Lucas Pardu, uh, job security enthusiast. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, yeah, like this is gross. Like, uh, you know, it, it, you haven't caused the problem but you've kind of pulled the covers off something that it, it, it's a shame, but hey, I think we need to fix this stuff, especially the 1.1. Like saying it won't happen, like it can, and somebody will do this. Request smuggling keeps coming back and, and biting us. So if if maybe the the idea is we pull the connect stuff out of 1.1.1.0 and try and make a document that's more coherent about the, the whole mask zoo of things, that could be an option. But I'd, I'd be willing to review and help support some of that work. Watson Lad, Akamai, we had a similar kind of issue with NTP where existing uses squatted over a whole bunch of interpretation of fields that were supposed to be free. It was bad. We only now just have a draft out fixing this. You might want to go register those types if they're going to be problems if they were later registered. 
Kazuho, uh, I think we have to do something for this. Uh, our precedence uh, in informational responses has been that there would be intermediaries. Therefore, there's concern in sending informational responses over HTTP. So if we follow that precedence, we have to do something. And regarding what we do, I think, I, I, I wonder if everybody is actually interested in optimizing HTTP 1.1 at this point. So I, I'd rather prefer you know, just forbidding this behavior in HTTP 1.1 and calling that a day. Uh, hi, Alex Schnahowski, Google. I mostly wanted to say from our experience in the mask working group, I feel like we did spend a huge amount of time trying to do HTTP 1.1 backwards compatibility for the core document set. And while I think that that was probably the correct thing to do because there is still growing adoption of H2 and H3, I think that we are probably crossing the threshold where in continuing to invest new features like this in H1, which already doesn't have particularly amazing performance characteristics, is probably not on the right side of the balance sheet for our energy. And I would prefer if we just mark this feature as H2 plus and maybe agreed on a moratorium of not really building more of these performance optimization type things into HTTP 1.1 and sort of encourage moving to H2 and newer protocols. So just to respond to that, the current draft takes essentially the what, what I would call the slower approach here, right? It does not have a performance, what I would call a performance optimization really for HTTP 1.1. I do think it's valuable to have an HTTP 1.1 specification for this uh, because of intermediaries that speak H1 on the back end. Sorry, the, the queue is closed. Oh. All right. Thank you very much. It sounds like we have some more discussion. Uh, we'll give you more time next time. Um, next up, Mr. Skenazi, I believe we have unprompted off. Oh, okay. Okay. I'll try and do it this time. Let's see, share. There we go. Good morning, everyone. I'm David Skenazi, and today I'll be your authentication enthusiast. Yay. Um, all right, so this is our unprompted authentication draft, which uh, my co-authors, Jonathan and is here locally and David Oliver is here remotely. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so to for folks who weren't in the room last time or who haven't read the rest, very yeah. short summary. The idea is we want the client to authenticate to the server. We wanna use asymmetric cryptography and we want the server to be able to hide the fact that the it offers this kind of authenticated resources. It, want to, it wants to be able to tell anyone without the keys, oh, I'm sorry, I have no idea what you're talking about, as opposed to, yes, I support this, but you don't have the keys, please authenticate. Um, so we adopted the document in this working group back in February. Uh, we had a great discussion in, at the last IETF in Yokohama, and we rewrote almost everything in the document after the discussion from the working group as is standard in this community. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm gonna go over the current rough shape of the solution and at the same time, what changed since last time. So the kind of key clever idea, thanks again, Chris Wood, in this document is to use a TLS key exporter to generate some fresh data and then we sign that data um, and send it, and the, the client signs it with its private key, sends it across and then the server can verify with the public key that the signature is valid. Uh, and it has the properties we want described from the previous slide. Uh, and it also has nice things that you can't replay it on a separate connection. Uh, next slide. Uh, all right, what changed? Uh, so uh, before this used to be a separate brand new unprompted authentication header. This is now a regular HTTP authentication scheme. So it fits into the existing mechanisms that we have in HTTP. It's called signature, because I was feeling particularly inspired. Um, and you can use it with authorization, with proxy authorization, and whatever other cool means we, we might end up designing for HTTP authentication. Uh, and we completely dropped the HMAC feature uh, from the spec, because uh, that was the feeling from the room last time, no one cared. Um, next slide. 
Uh, so the TLS keying exporter uh, is a construction from underlying TLS. And one of its properties is you can pass it a context. Think of it like some extra data that you feed in that gets then hashed as with the uh, TLS master secret and to, to generate the uh, key mat output from the exporter. So we decided to put everything we could think of in there because more things covered by the signature equals better, as I'm told by the cryptographers. Um, so what we landed on was which signature algorithm we're using, uh, the key ID, which is kind of the key into the server's database of public keys, uh, the, HD, the origin, so scheme, host, and port. Uh, and we decided on the realm, which is a concept that exists in HTTP authentication, which allows the server to say, I have multiple realms on this origin. It's not particularly defined and it's defined as like, if you don't need it, it's the empty string. So we just added it here. If you use HTTP realms, you can use it. Otherwise you just have a zero byte and you're done. Um, we decided not to add the full URL and as in the path and query are not part of this. Um, and that allows us for when you have repeated requests on the same origin, you end up with the same uh, authentication. And that way you, using H2 or H3 header compression, you only send it once, which is kind of nice. Uh, and you'll see soon why we end up, that, that'll save a non-zero amount of bytes. Next slide, please. Um, all right, so uh, turns out when you get people to read documents that have things like signatures in them, they tell you that you got it all wrong, which is great. Um, so turns out that there are plenty of attacks here. The seems legit paper is super interesting if you haven't read it. Um, and one of the things that I didn't know is that there are some signature schemes where you can have, if you carefully craft your key, you can have a key that we're all, or a signet, your key and your signature, it can be valid for multiple inputs, which can be used for evil things. So as a way to kind of rule out that entire class of attack, instead of just, when we use the key exporter to, and to generate this kind of nonce that we're gonna sign, instead of just generating that, we generate a bit more data, so 16 bytes, and we send that in the header. So that allows, the server to ascertain that the client indeed has access to the T TLS master secret, that it actually ran the exporter, as opposed to just gave you a signature that happens to be valid over everything. Um, crypto is hard. Uh, next slide. Uh, additionally, uh, when you sign things, um, you you can run into attacks if someone reuses their public keys for multiple different protocols. Um, of course, in the document, we say you must not do that, but people still like to run with scissors. So let's build a little system to avoid this. So we just copy pasted what TLS 1.3 does, which is instead of just signing a nonce, you have this little static string before and instead of something that mentions TLS, we have something that mentions HTTP signature authentication so that if you can have a signature for this, you're not gonna be able to use it for TLS if someone were to reuse the same public private key pair for both, which is a terrible idea, but even if they did, now we avoid this problem. Um, our next slide. All right, so all of this uh, now that we have, uh, it allows us to send a really nice entire phone book with our header. Um, so you put the key ID in there, you put the signature algorithm, uh, you put the verification and you put the proof. And, but wait, we can add more. Um, next slide, please. All right, so I wanna apologize for the group. I was in a rush, I only had time to put one meme in this slide. Um, so, I hear y'all like structured headers. Uh, everything should be a structured header. We love structured headers around this. And seeing by how much Mnot is staring at me and glaring at me and going up in the queue, see how much he's twitching because I said structured header instead of structured fields. I hear that you all care about your structured headers uh, and your structured that, fields. That's Julian, you're feeling staring at you from thousands of miles away. <laughs> um, go ahead, Mark. Oh, no, no, finish your little thing. Oh, well, <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, I was about to go to the next slide. So if you have a question on this one. 
So many. Um, uh, so you're you. We want every field to be, or even every header. Let's use your terminology. Every header to be a structured header, not every value to be a structured header. Indeed. And, and I, I feel like that may be where you're going. Exactly. Okay. Uh, all right. Next slide, please. So um, right now we have a bunch of parameters as part of authentication. We saw like V is this verification. We have the, the key ID and a bunch of them, including the proof, the verification and the key ID are byte sequences. Like your signature is a sequence of bytes. And so the way you get that across in HTTP headers is base 64. Um, and you know, everything should be a structured header. So structured headers support byte sequences and the way they're represented is with base 64 surrounded by colons, um, except auth parameters are not structured headers. Those were defined way back. And I forget, I don't think you're opening that can of worms in retrofit, are you? Uh, no, and I'm get, maybe, uh, anyway, so yeah. So, and the reason it's not trivial to open up that can of worms in retrofit is that <laughs> it doesn't quite work easily. So here is the uh, IBNF for those parameters and they're tokens or quoted strings, but that means that you, you can't put colons in there. Um, so what we did is we added quotes. Um, I forget, what's the next slide? Uh, yeah, so uh, we right now the draft has quotes then colons, uh, which is kind of gross. Uh, some people said it's still kind of neat that because once you've removed the quotes, you can pass that into your structured header parser, but eh. So the two obvious proposals here are we keep this thing where we have quotes and colons, or the second one is we just say this is not a parameter structured and we just use base64 URL and we did disallow padding because padding in base64 is only useful if you can concatenate them which we won't ever doesn't make sense to do here so I see that people have thoughts all right um, I can't see the cue from this angle I'm, I'm I was first um, go for it so as one of the authors for the privacy pass authentication scheme which has this exact same property, I would love to see alignment between those. And we had the same thing. So um, we ended up on neither of these. <laughs> no, because we're doing, we're doing the base 64 in quotes. All um, right, so we have no proposal colons. three. <laughs> no colons, just yeah. quotes. And I think that's kind of what it had to be to make sure that, because the thing is not necessarily a token because it could start with a number, I think. so. It, the, the safe thing was to put it in quotes. Or, sorry, you, sorry okay. I'm going to insert myself. So, but it, you, do you mean when you say token, no, do you yeah, mean I structured don't. field token or do you no, mean, I don't mean structured field HTTP token. token? I mean, I, I forget all of the context, but what ended <laughs> up being the safe thing was to do base 64 in quotes. Okay. And so, okay. That, surely someone in the room can answer the question can the token start with a number? Because yeah. if, if it yes. can't, yeah? Yes. All right. So I H think HTTP token, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, the, for, per I, the I ABNF it, for authentication parameters, proposal two should work. I think we do explicitly allow the equals to be there. Uh, oh, okay. I think that's yeah. why. That's um, all right. Okay. And like, you obviously don't need to have them, but if you do have them, it's just like, it's always safe to have the quotes around it, but you definitely don't need the colons. Anyway. Okay. But perhaps we could agree on not proposal one and then move on to that. That sounds good. Um, I. All right. Well, let, let, let's, the queue's not that crazy. Go ahead. Mark. Yeah. Um, Martin Thompson, I don't want to talk about this. I want you to fix it. Um, and I want to talk about the last thing. Yep. That's uh, agreed. Do, do other people want to talk about this yeah. thing? Or how about this? I th personally, I think proposal two is the way to go. Uh, but uh, does, can everyone live with that? If not, like, raise your hand, come up to the mic. Yeah. All right, that sounds like we can we, move We can do that. this in the issue probably. Talk, okay, all right. Talk it, to Tommy and make sure that we align on this one and wh whatever is necessary, but um, can, can you go, go back a couple of slides? Because this is yep. just syntax. Yeah. All right, so we'll resolve this. Please go to issue 2581 if yeah. you care. To all of the stuff we're 
um, David was talking about how he very meticulously reconstructed the stuff that we did in the TLS working group um, with, yeah, all that stuff. All right. So it's, I was looking at this, this discussion, we're going through and we're having a bunch of conversations on the on GitHub about this one, and I want to make sure that it happened here as well. Um, this is parallel invention of an existing feature that, that is in TLS. And all of the things that you described are exactly the sorts of things that we went through in designing the exported authenticators. And what you have done is invented exported authenticators, probably not as well, because I think there's probably a few things you missed. And Jonathan may, may disagree with me or agree with me. Um, and I notice he's after me in the queue. Oh, he was. Um, uh, I think we should just use exported authenticators for this. And there are a bunch of really nice properties of those. And one of which is that we don't have to do a whole bunch of careful crypto cryptographic analysis in this working group and replicate the work that's been done for those. So over to others. I'd love to hear people's opinions on that one. My personal take is that those had a layer of complexity that was quite a bit more than this. Um, but I'll, I'll take an action to look through that a bit more. Um, uh, Mike Bishop, Akamai, I'm I was going to say more or less the same thing. I think <coughs> exported authenticators would cover this. Um, there is a module of the question of TLS stack support for them, which is maybe an issue that we would need to think around. Um, the complexity that you're concerned about, I think mostly comes from the certificate request form, which you, this is unprompted. The server's not asking for anything. So you just pass in an old request. And I think that would simplify it down a fair bit. The other thing is that the, the key, it has to be representable as something in TLS. So it might be nice if it's a cert, but if it's not a cert, TLS can accommodate those. And thank you. Thanks, Mike. That makes sense. Yeah, I second this. This sounds like the discussion we had five years ago in exporter authenticators, including all the pitfalls, you hit them one after the other. After the other. <laughs> um, uh, in in particular, like in one one thing that sort of struck out, uh, that stuck out for me here was the um, definable context for the TLS exporter. It's not necessary if you're going to be signing the fields anyway. You just it, we also don't typically define a. We don't actually sign the fields. We just sign the output of the TLS exporter. So that's why we shove things into the context so that they end up in there. Okay, so that's was also a potential security issue because those things are now implicit in the derivation of the uh, exporter, but not covered by the signature. So there's a potential confusion issue there. You get a signature failure rather than an explicit mismatch. Um, and uh, generally speaking, yeah, TLS exported authenticators with raw public keys, you don't need a cert for it. It's any certificate type. Uh, would make sense and it's structured and it doesn't need a TLS library to work. It's effectively this it, with uh, TLS framing rather than structured fields. Is, that's my understanding. Okay, I'll, I'll take an action item to right, think about how this would look uh, based on TLS support authenticators and see if I can convince myself that it makes sense and it's not a pain to implement, but that sounds reasonable. So um, as the person who did the security analysis of both exported authenticators and this, uh, yes, they're very similar. Uh, the key thing that doesn't exist is that exported authenticators is explicitly not defined as unprompted. And if the client is sending it, it has to be requested by the server. Um, Yes, the spec says that. Um, well, whether that's a good idea or not is, is a different question. Uh, and then I think the reason why was there was some issue with early data 
So if the client sent an exported authenticator in early data, it didn't, uh, it didn't have the same security properties. Right. Um, it was, I, I'm trying to remember what it was. I think it was that if the authentication was going to fail, then the client certificate was still leaked, right? It, it was a privacy thing, not a security thing. Um, uh, but yeah, so I, I, I think we could solve that if we change exported authenticator to say the client can go first and don't do it in early data. All right, um, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of people RFC. staring at the ceiling because they're thinking about this. Uh, let's let's think about it some more. Clearly, mm -hmm. this this sounds like it might be possible. So let's figure it out if that's the case. That there's an issue. Great, uh, Kyle. Kyle Neckwitz, uh, if exported <coughs> authenticator is proved too complicated for some reason um, for the library complexity, another option is the token binding construction. Um, and I know that right now token binding is negotiated at the TLS layer also, but an option for that is to negotiate through an out of band mechanism, just like we do here. Yeah, and, and like, as with those, like this construction looks a lot like token binding. You're, you're right. Um, okay, thanks. All right. Um, so I, again, I'll, I'll also need to go back and look at the export authenticators. My recollection is that at least from a crypto standpoint, the client should be able to generate it and we may just need to open things up for that. Um, and I would argue for doing that as far as complexity and layering, um, you, on Thursday, we're going to present, uh, there's going to be a presentation on kind of trying to revive secondary certs. Um, at least for the <clears throat> server giving that. Uh, that is a thing that is useful for some of these same proxying use cases that uh, I think we're interested in for, um, for the unprompted auth. And so uh, if you're going to have to implement something anyway, uh, using the same mechanism between both of them sounds good. And you know, I personally uh, did the implementation for expert authenticators in like three different TLS stacks to get this all working for us. And it's not too bad. And I'd love to have to only do that once and not also do this thing. So that, that, that makes sense. And like, I'll have to, you know, it might be possible to use the TLS export authenticators and then kind of encode them at the HTTP layer as an auth scheme. Again, I'll have to think about it more to see uh, and where that goes. Chris. Yeah, uh, not to, I guess, further complicate things, but, um, uh, but. <laughs> uh, uh, building on export authenticators or you, Reversing that with some slight changes to let the client go first seems reasonable. Um, uh, we implemented this, um, and it turns out that like uh, if you don't really have uh, like an HTTP like API that gives you access to the TLS layer, it's quite complicated, obviously, to implement because so you, you can't like poke at something and say, "Give me the exported thing that I need." Um, uh, so I, I don't know how. Uh, widespread that problem will be for different implementations or if you really have to open up the stack a bit to implement this for the use cases that you care about. But um, it, it, if it's like particularly problematic, it might be worth like considering if we need to bind this to TLS at all and maybe doing it entirely at the application layer. Just a thought based on the implementation experience. Yeah, well, the, the important thing here is that if you have a signature you need to sign something fresh and you don't have anything fresh at the application layer for sure there are like like questions like that to deal with but so like one thing that was was discussed like what if you just like have the client generate a random nonce and a timestamp and sign that and like have the server like do some sort of check to see like this is not too fresh like uh, jonathan's gonna like just say you can't like prove that and like the the, the, the things that i'm doing which yeah fine but like um uh, this this is like it turned out to be a real implementation hurdle, um, at least for us. So, um, just noting it. Okay, yeah, Jonathan, I'll, I'll look we, at the very. We closed the queue, but if you can be very di quick. direct response to Chris's thing, um, yes, we disagree at the mic fine. It's fine. Um, the I, I did the security analysis of that. Um, I think I even showed you the slides. Uh, I I can prove that that's insecure, and it comes up with like three or four attacks, Tamron. So, uh, yeah, let's not do that. Okay. Thanks. Um, you had one slide left. Do you have yeah. enough food for thought or do you want to do that too? So I would like to do part of that slide. Okay. Uh, so that, you know, if we decide to switch to exported authenticators, a bunch of that slide doesn't make sense, but some of it still does. Uh, 
So kind of this system relies on the client having a public private key pair and the server having a database of public keys pretty standard. Uh, and that database is indexed on key ID. And the registration protocol, as in the client telling the server, hey, my key ID is this, and my public key is this, is out of scope. Because every app generally, you know, if you're a VPN provider, you already have a system for that. We don't want to specify a new system for exchanging keys. Um, that said, uh, as in our quest to uh, allow people to run with scissors and not injure themselves. Um, there are some attacks where you don't have a proper bind. If you don't have a proper binding between key IDs and public keys, uh, weird stuff can happen. So Jonathan can talk a bit more about that. But the thing we had here was to add the public key to the uh, key exporter that which to remove some class of those attacks. Um, Turns out that then you have to talk about like reliable encoding of public keys if you put it in the context, um, or sorry, deterministic encoding of public keys, which is a bundle of fun. I don't want to touch ASN1. So kind of my question for the group here that is still re relevant one way or another is <clears throat> this, I, like, is this class of attack in scope? For example, like my mental model was you have a registration protocol that's not completely broken. And the output of that is that you have a unidirectional mapping of key ID to public key, where a key ID only ever matches one public key. And you also never do key rotation. Um, or if you do, you know, then you restart this and whatever. Um, well, how do people feel about that? Like, do they think that this class of attack is important to solve because it gets into some like hairy, hairy tamarind things that are outside of my understanding? Or do we just say, hey, we have a, we assume that you have that database. And if you don't, well, that's, then you don't use this. How do people feel about that? Um, uh, Chris Wood. Um, I don't have a super strong feeling, though. Um, it does seem like it would be sensible to document the assumptions that you're making about the registration protocol. Ab absolutely. Okay. Um, assuming you do that, then I'm happy with whatever else uh, people think. Thanks. Yeah, I, I think it's pretty important that the client and the server agree on which public key was being used in, as part of this. So um, I, I think we can probably work, work with this. I'll talk to you offline about how I think we can work on it. Wait, just to clarify, are you saying we can work on it in terms of documenting it as an assumption of the protocol or as in working on it as in fixing it at the protocol layer? I, I think we need to fix it. Yeah. Okay. Dennis Jackson. So if you do something like export, exported authenticators, you kind of get this for free, um, which is nice. I think you do want to do this because people <clears throat> will use like short truncated key IDs and just expect it to work. And obviously like it won't. Okay, thanks. No, that's, that's useful feedback. Uh, all right. Uh, with exported authenticators, you don't get it for free. You just directly send it on the wire explicitly. It's free. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, all right, and that's it for this. That's definitely have food for thought. The editors will look at exported authenticators and see. I really love the getting things for free because the less work I have to do, the happier I am. Modular job security. Uh, so thanks everyone for your time and on to the next one. Thank you very much. That was lots of fun. Um, one moment. We have structured headers, I mean fields. Yeah, this is really not helping, this this picker. Oh, there we go. I think that's it. Yeah, that's it. So while we're doing this screen share, uh, if you haven't signed in to the data tracker for this session, please do so. There's a QR code up on the screen there. There should be a blue sheet uh, passing around, which feels weird to say that because of how it works now. Uh, where is that sheet? Someone have it? Oh, it's just sitting up in the corner already. Right. Can, can you circulate that, David? Because I saw some AMS staff uh, walking around earlier counting heads and 
I know they'll yell at us if we don't have good numbers that match their head count. Don't get us yelled at. Um, so now we're going to talk about structured fields, uh, BIS. This document, uh, we took it to last call, I believe. We had one big issue raised in that, which was the uh, uh, ability to use non-ASCII strings uh, for some use cases. <clears throat> we ended up agreeing, uh, there was a consensus declaration by Tommy that uh, we would uh, add display strings as we decided to call it. Uh, we had a PR for that. And the only uh, uh, issue that kind of came out of that discussion was uh, this one uh, from PHK. Uh, and the issue is basically, look, we're using two kinds of encoding in the same structure. That's really not great. Uh, and, and so uh, the obvious thing to do here was to just use percent encoding. Um, I put together a PR for that, and that's been reviewed by some folks. Wow, this is laggy. Um, and it's, it's relatively straightforward. Uh, the only issue uh, in the, the reviews of the PR that I think merits some discussion is uh, uh, whether or not we normalize case in the percent encoding. So it can contain the percent encoded characters, <coughs> excuse me, can contain you know, letters. Uh, 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 in many contexts, those are case insensitive. But uh, in structured fields, we're being very exact about how things work and, and how they're serialized. Um, and and a, a couple of folks have said, yeah, we should probably uh, uh, define which case should be used and mandate that. I'm pushing back on that a little bit because uh, people are likely to use existing libraries for working with percent encoding. They're quite prevalent, especially the URI libraries and they generally do not enforce a case. Um, and so there are two separate decisions here. One is, is do we mandate a case for serialization? And then do we enforce a case when we're parsing? And if my concern is if someone uses one of those libraries, <coughs> excuse me, they may not have access to, to, to enforce a particular case. Um, or you know they may not decide to go and do the extra effort to enforce the case. Um, also, I feel like this is a little bit strictness for strictness sake. Um, we have other places where there are potentially alternate serializations of our structured data and we don't enforce a single serialization, canonical serialization there either. So I see Martin shaking his head and pacing. Go for it. Yeah, I, I find it kind of odd to think that this would be the def the default here would be that you would pick up a library to do something that is like two lines of code mm. yeah okay um i i don't want to have dependency on on the uri spec I, th I think we should specify what it is that we mean uh, rather than go off and have someone it's very poorly specified in that, spe in, in that specification, at least by the standards that we've applied thus far sure. to this specification. And I would rather us deal with the, the encoding thing here, at, at which point, yeah, we can just pick uppercase or lowercase or what have you okay. and just go with it that way. I, I, I think concretely, most of the things that we have in the specification are, wow, there's a ringing out of this microphone, it's bad. Um, they, they are canonical. Um, simply by virtue of having the specification being very precise about how it how it manages things, and maintaining that would be, I think, a, a, a good idea. Most, not all, but most, yeah, yeah. I, I, I suppose maybe the way to, to to resolve this is to actually go and make the change you're suggesting and see how onerous it is. Um, and I'm not against that. I'm just want to make sure we consider that. Did I hear you volunteer to revise the URI spec in the middle of that? No. Okay. Oh, him. Yeah. Um, Chris. Any other thoughts? With Chris Lemons. And then Kazuko. Uh, oh, Chris. Chris, go first. Uh, basically, that. The, um, yeah, people are going to use existing libraries, but asking for an extra call to L case or U case at the end for those things is probably not too onerous. Mm. 
Chris Lemons. See, that, that's what worries me a little bit because that is now one extra thing to do. It has a little bit of a perf. Yeah. Because the whole I think I kind of agree with what Mark said. I'm not sure if, uh, I mean, this thing is really canonical considering the fact that we don't prohibit, uh, for example, also numeric characters to be using the percent encoding. So to check if the values, values are equivalent, we have to decode it regardless. So I don't think there's a practical benefit in requiring them to be in lowercase or uppercase. No. No. Great, we just lost the connection or something. Yeah, I, I think if, if there was a security implication that we could illustrate or something, that would maybe be a different discussion, but, but I, I, don't, I don't sense a strong motivation here. Now, now that's not to say that I, I, agree, I think I agree with you, Martin, that maybe we shouldn't rely on the URI spec and maybe we should specify this ourselves, but I don't know that that's motivation to require a particular case. I, I don't know if this is like convincing or not, but there are performance implications for, for being uh, having to process both upper and lower case, right? So, you know, whatever. Yeah. 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 I don't know. We, we shape these things off in a number of ways in different places, like the uh, field names are uh, all lowercase now, right? Yeah. Arguably, if we're concerned about the performance cost of converting, sure. then you know, that's roughly equivalent to the performance cost of having to fix it in parsing. So, so then this is the real problem. How do we choose which case? How me set up a poll? I mean, just so so. Um, it was on the screen previously, but oh, I yeah. um, I suggested language. Oh, I, hate this one. Um, I suggested language, and um, I suggested that maybe you could cite RFC forty six forty eight, and in RFC forty six forty eight, it's uppercase. Take, okay. take that for what you will, but <coughs> someone, someone else has obviously fl flipped a coin previously uh, and no sense in like reflipping it. Sure. Sometimes it makes sense to oh, never mind. Yeah, no, that's fine. I, I'm, I'm gratified that this is what we're down to with this spec. Like, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. I think that's any other, so assuming that that's the case, we'll go ahead and work through that, maybe have a bit more discussion. And then I think we can shift this back. Yeah, we can, we can do it like a second last call. Okay. And then, you know, two weeks or something and then move on. Okay. Let's move on then to retrofit structured fields. And I think the only one that really, this is almost editorial. The one we really want to discuss is uh, 2521. And, and this is basically working through the implications of uh, how extensions work in mapped fields. And I asked folks for feedback on this, I think a number of times in the issue by CCing people, and I'm talking to myself. So now I've got you all trapped in a room. Um, yeah. Um, and so the, the kind of my thinking here is that, you know, if, if, if you read the issue, I, I, I won't read the actual issue, but for a map field, if you've got a complex one like cookie, when future extensions can be defined, you really have two choices. You can either say all future extensions to that existing field have to be syntactically compatible with structured fields types, or you have to define, predefine a type for those future extensions and shove them all into that type. Uh, otherwise, you know, someone's going to define an extension that a st generic structured fields parser is going to look at and say, I don't know. And that's not a map field anymore. That's, you know, something else. Um, and, and so the kind of, I don't think we have to choose one approach here, but if, if, if that analysis is largely correct, which is what I'm really wanting feedback on, uh, uh, that has implications. We need to make a decision for, for different kinds of headers. For cookie and set cookie, I've already had some informal chats with some of the cookie folks and said, is it okay if all future extensions have to be syntactically valid structured fields? And they've said, yeah, that seems reasonable. I really want to hundred percent make sure they understand the implications of that. And that means we need to put actual text in the cookie spec 
constraining future extensions to cookies. Um, and then I think we can close that one off. Uh, for authorization on www authenticate, which is the other issue we have open, I think we have to make this choice. Um, and I think it's probably the same thing. We need to actually update the HTTP spec and say future, you know, if we really mean this, if we're going to define those headers, we have to update the, the HTTP spec and say that future schemes have to fall into this bucket. Um, it's a little different because uh, authorization and www authenticate uh, uh, do have the base64 form. But because they also have the parameterized form, you know, you, you probably want to say something like it has to be either a structured fields token, which is not an HTTP token, or a structured field string, which is almost an HTTP string. But it can't be something else, you know, other forms of tokens and strings in HTTP. Um, and then for link template, which is uh, in, in another working group, but also is infected by this, we've already made this decision. It always requires parameters to be serialized as strings, which that's a way to do it too. Um, any thoughts? I see Julian's on the queue. Julian, we can't hear you yet. But now. Yes. Okay, sorry. Uh, I don't, still don't get why we have a problem with authentication because the parameters are either a token or a quoted string. As you said, um, the tokens in HTTP are not structured field tokens. So the only thing that we can say that will always work is this is a string. I mean, if you have a token, you have to put it into a structured field string. And if it's a string, it needs to go into a structured field string. And there is no other kind of type in authentication. Hmm. And there will I, have, um, sorry, go ahead. There's, there's no extension point there. Hmm. It's fixed. Unless I'm I hear, what, I hear what you're saying. I am concerned that I know you believe that, that uh, uh, tokens and strings are interchangeable. In, in parameters in HTTP. I'm not convinced that people who implement and use parameters understand that and that some of them lock in and say, well, this has to be a token or this has to be a string. I could be wrong. I'd be happy to be wrong, but I don't know enough to, to say definitively that that's not the case. Zuho, no? Okay. Tommy? Um, so on that point, um, earlier we were talking about for the unprompted auth, what format that is. And I, I did my homework on what we did in Privacy Pass. And we had reviewed that a lot with Julian. So we did end up being like, hey, you know, this is either a token or a string. And it really just depends on if there's the padding there, whether or not it's there. And we did have to go through and make sure the implementations all handled both. So. There are at least you know cases where we are having efforts to not ossify around assuming it's just one. And it'd be nice to have something written down for that. Okay. Yeah. Martin. I think I think what Julian is really saying here is that the that the mapping for authorization is complete, necessarily complete, and that no extension to authorization will be such that it cannot fit within the mapping that exists. I'm not sure that's necessarily true for all of the other fields that we're talking about yeah, here. Yeah. Um, and so I guess the question is what our philosophy is with respect to uh, the mappings themselves. Mm. Do we expect to have a, an escape valve whereby you have the non-mapped version available in, in certain contexts? Or is this exclusively the case that um, you're using the mappings and only the mappings? Because if that if it's the latter case and you're only using the mappings, then if an extension exists or is defined, then we do have to deal with this problem. Otherwise, I, I don't know that we really do need to deal with this problem, except maybe informally, as in when it comes time to to define an extension to link template, we can say, well, you know, that's not going to fit <coughs> very well in structured fields. Therefore, maybe we should do it this different way. Yeah. Um, I don't know what, what the philosophy is here. And so I, I don't know what the right answer is. Yeah. 
the philosophy is that, yeah, uh, to use this specification, you need to be able to fall back, at least for the, uh, uh, the other fields, the compatible fields. Uh, the map fields are, to this point, we've been trying to make sure that they're complete mappings. Um, but, but yeah, certainly we can take the same bar there too. Yeah, I, I think in, in that light, if, the, if, there are the fall, if the fallback exists, then uh, that means that we don't have an absolute requirement right. to, to curtail, we can say, um, suggest, as opposed to uh, create a, a constraint. Because otherwise, it's a bit weird for us to, to define what is essentially a transformation of a, of, a, of a field, but then go back and apply constraints such that the transformation is possible. That's, I, yeah. I find that a little awkward, and I'd rather so, avoid that if possible. So, so apply that thinking to cookies, for example. Yeah, I, again, I don't think there's anything we've done in cookies that would be a, be a problem like mm -hmm. in the past, and I don't anticipate there being a problem in the future for a mapping. So maybe that's sufficient. And, and so you're saying we don't need to have a hard requirement of cookie spec? Yeah, uh, although this specification could contain advice to people who are extending the, the mapped fields that we're defining. Mm -hmm. and, if you and want to be... Yeah. I, ideally, what you would do is this, mm -hmm. which is define them using structured fields, compatible types that, that fit within these mappings. I, I, I don't know. I can live with that, I think. Um, yeah, uh, to me, that takes me to the, the other issue, which is authorization and dub dub authenticate. You know, if we're going to say that that has to always map to strings, that kind of makes me unhappy because we've got folks stuffing binary stuff in there. Come on, you know? So yeah, I don't know what to do about that though. Yeah. So concretely in that case, I don't know how someone presented with the string that is the unmapped version of authorization. Is that an S or a Z, by the way? It should be a Z. Sorry, he's he's gone native. I typed it. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know how someone presented with that string would be able to make a decision about whether to map it as a string or a binary thing if we allow for the possibility of binary. Yeah. Now, it may be that if you directly construct one in a native form, you are you have the ability to put binary in there in mm -hmm. place of the string. I think I think that may be something that we want, might want to consider there. Well, so a little while ago, we ripped out the mapping headers, the new headers, uh, uh, the new field names. Yeah. <clears throat> to make this work, you'd really need to define a pair of new fields, and Would then you? I think so. Yeah. Because I. I to make it useful. To make it interoperable, potentially, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. And then, and then you'd say, well, these are structured fields, and uh, here's how you carry these existing authentication schemes. And if you define a new authentication scheme, scheme, you can define it to explicitly fit into this if you want to. Otherwise, you can't use it here. Oh, yeah. That's interesting. And so, so David's new thing could say explicitly. I am a foo header. Yeah. I am yeah. A, I, I'm a structured. S SF authenticator, whatever, you know. Yeah, and well, the other way to do that is, uh, yeah, okay, I don't have a good answer for that. It's, it's all getting, yeah. 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 But that's effectively an upgrade of the entire authentication framework. And I feel like that should be a separate piece of work, maybe. That's not just a retrofit. Yeah. Okay. So I think I've got a direction on this issue. And I think on this uh, authentic authorization and dubbed up authenticate headers, my inclination is still to punt on that because as, as I just said, that's not really retrofit anymore. That's kind of a bigger issue. Because if, if, if we just say everything's a string, we're not really getting the value out of structured fields there. Any further thoughts on that? I know Chris would, uh, you had some desire for that, I think. Sorry, uh, we're talking about the, the retrofit version or the map version of auth the authentication headers. If, if we didn't do that, would that make you incredibly sad? Okay. Don't wanna make Chris sad, so yeah, okay. All right, I think that's all we have uh, for that spec unless anybody else has anything else. I think I, I wanna get this incorporated and then step back and have a look at it and figure out 
is this still the right shape and is it trying to do the right things is it at the right level of vagueness and abstraction or do we need to do more or less because it, it is a somewhat speculative piece of work in that it doesn't actually allow you to write any code right now and that makes I know that makes us a little nervous too okay um, so yeah, this, I don't think this, even though we'll probably drain the issues list, I think we'll probably step back and think about it before we go to last call. And that leaves us at query. Um, just a brief update, Julian, I know you're here. Do you want to talk about it all or? Ah, there we are. Yeah, I, um, yeah I, I'd like to apologize that there has been no progress. Um, I really has, have been busy with other things outside the IETF. And um, when I had time, I concentrated on structured fields and the two digest specs, which I think we are going to finish in the next few weeks. So um, after that, um, I'm hoping to get back to that when I do my IETF work. Great. Okay. So watch this space. We'll get some, some motion on query soon, hopefully. Um, next up, we have a very brief update, I think, uh, uh, regarding the alt service uh, task force. Mike, did you want to say a few words or? Um, so much like Julian's comment, there hasn't been a whole lot of movement here. Um, part of that is that we would like to see some implementation and trying out what we have defined so far. So if you have implemented or are interested in implementing, please let us know. If you haven't implemented and could, that would be fantastic. Otherwise, this draft kind of sits here. So, thank you. Thanks, Mike. And now we have a short uh, update from the WebSockets design team. Lucas? Oh, you can let me stop this then. Or yeah, I need to stop, don't I? Okay. No, I can just... Oh, okay. So I'm Lucas, I'm uh, uh, threading a needle, or the, the thin eye of the needle enthusiast. Uh, this is a report on the design team set up to help can draw considerations and maybe come up with some proposals about the discovering web sockets over HTTP2 and HTTP3, stuff that we discussed in the, the last IETF in Yokohama. And so uh, as part of that, we look for some volunteers to come in and we had some good response, uh, good, fairly uh, good representation from clients, servers and other folks who are just interested in WebSockets. Um, as usual, you know, people get a bit busy and they, they kind of contribute and then they get distracted with other things that are more important. So in trying to thread that eye of the needle, I've taken some discretion as the lead to try and draw what I think were the conclusions from that. And that might not be fully representative of what everyone in that group thought, but uh, I've encouraged them to come up and have some discussion uh, at the mic line, just in case that's that. So uh, we, I tweaked the slides late, late. Uh, I wanted to do some late binding while I was here this week to try and see if we could resolve some of those things or get some clarity. Um, I've done the best I can, but these slides I'm gonna present, I think are slightly stale. The tweaks are different. If we could update the data tracker after that'd be great, but otherwise let's just crack on. Um, so we had, yeah, this has been going on for two years. Got a list of folks who volunteered. Thank you very much. This was a, a, a team of people globally distributed and there were a lot of flexibility in hours. So I really appreciate the efforts and inputs there. And what we wanted to do is try and draw the key points out that we discussed last time and have discussed on the mailing list for the last couple of years. Um, and I'm sitting Robin Marx's Barbie Thunder here, um, that effectively these are the ones that I think were the most key, that when a client sees a WSS <coughs> URL, it has to make a bet on the connection to use to open the web socket to it. Um, and this isn't 
a WebSocket that takes over the whole connection. This is a, a WebSocket, effectively a stream for the WebSocket resource. Um, and that could fail. And if it fails, it can fall back and do something different. And that's OK. Um, but using HTTP2 and HTTP3 has advantages because of the multiplexing and the, the, the other uh, benefits that that has of shared fates and lifetimes and connection reuse and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so you want to do that if you can as a client. But if you make the wrong bet, that has an impact. It has an impact on the latency aspects on the client side. You waste a round trip. Um, we think that's uh, important. Others might disagree, but we think this is important. If it's not important, we probably don't need to do anything. And you can just live with how things work today. But if we do want to solve it, we need a solution that can do that. And it also wastes things on the server side. Uh, people opening connections because they believe it's going to uh, the, 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 the connection is going to satisfy the expectations or requirements that it has, and it fails, and then you fall back. And, and that's a waste for everyone. Um, so what we want to achieve is to increase the chance that the client can bet on the correct horse. There's information out there that they can use. Things are implicit. Maybe there's some history and heuristics. But we we'll just want to front load a lot of this stuff to avoid wastage. Um, the other key point here is that picking between H1 and H2 is different from picking H3. Um, and this is because of the underlying transport protocol, you know, TCP uh, and the quick. Uh, and therefore, the decisions that the client needs to make or the choices or the bets vary. And trying to find a solution across those two things is tricky. A solution that works for maybe the choice between H1 and H2 it's hard to apply to H3, and that maybe we don't need to solve that. But if we could, that would be fantastic. And in, in the discussion, uh, we've talked, I think, last time about other things that also use extended connect that maybe would fall into this bracket. But through the course of the discussion, we, we really wanted to descope those things. We have an issue with WebSockets, and we think we can do better. Uh, stuff like mask, we, we're talking in other groups, as we should, about um, proxy discovery and aspects where you can have uh, a different form of communication of the expectations or capabilities of the endpoints uh, and, and what should happen. And the failing modes and conditions are different. Web transport similarly has its own uh, model and interactions. Maybe some of the things we're saying could apply there, but that was not our focus here. And so what we did is, is take those points and kind of break them out into properties of the solution. So we want to come up with some proposals and what, what are the important things that the uh, solution should have? Because there's many solutions and some are good in some areas and some are not so great in others. Uh, and this was the list that the group came up with and we ranked. So priority at the top, the most thing important and the one at the bottom. Um, and, and you know, this is kind of a throw, throw it at the wall, see what sticks and then try and see what we think is really needed versus this would be nice to have because it improves you know, the warm and fuzzy feeling we have if we deploy this thing. And other stuff that's probably really important for the end solution, such as the ones at the bottom, like downgrade protection or, or other stuff. Like we, we came up with this and then we realized we needed some more clarification even within the design team and we didn't feel we had the time and or expertise to do that. So I see Kazoo in the queue, is this a clarifying question? Or, yep. A uh, couple of clarifying questions. Uh, in, in the first priority, you say that be able to establish WebSocket support without additional round trips. Does it mean, is there a premise that there's already an existing H connection using HTTP and then starting WebSocket connection, or is it about starting WebSocket uh, connection where from, from a point where there's nothing? Uh, a bit of both. I think you know, th th this is some of the difficulty in, in trying to understand, depending on the approach, what a client might already have open. So if it has a connection open and it had the information that that was WebSockets over H2 capable already, whether that's based on uh, a clear signal or some historic information, um, you know, it, it's going to make the extended connect request and that would fail and then it needs to fall back. That's one round trip. If it's going to fall back and open the TCB connection, you know, that's multiple extra round trips. I think, um, yeah, sorry. Uh, and there's other, there's other conditions. But effectively, as I say, the key point is around 
reduction of latency. If what we can do is get to a point where a client can not have additional round trips on top of round trips it would have to make, then that is a good end result. Um, yeah, I'll just go through these quickly as well, because um, I think explaining some of this would, would help actually. So, you know, the second one is about um, server needing rollback support. And this is kind of what I was talking about last time. So the ability to uh, have uh, phased rollout migrations, turning things off if they're going wrong, um, an ability to kind of change your mind or have more control other than trying to sledgehammer everything everywhere all at the same time. But that's different to point three, which is effectively reneging on something that you, you advertise. So mid-connection. Uh, trying to yank the rug out from under the client is just something we, we think is pointless of trying to solve for. But we kind of have this situation already with, with connections that, um, you know, maybe, well, there's various reasons. And we kind of solve this with, go away, we're going to drain you, and we'll honor what we said before. We really don't want to, and maybe it'll break. But, you know, you've got an opportunity, and we're going to tell you the new thing um, and the new conditions that we support. Um, we've got things like hop by hop support. We want to avoid proxies and change of proxies, getting confused about the kind of WebSockets support that there is, um, or and then confusing the client. It would be really nice to have some logical consistency between H2 and 3. This is the general HTTP thing that we might not be able to. There might be good reasons we need slightly different solutions, but wherever possible, if they can align as, as much, then that just makes rationale of the design uh, easier. Um, and what would be nice is to, to, to determine the status of the port of the support after a connection is established. So um, I can't quite phrase what that means now. If somebody else in the design team can do it succinctly, but um, we don't want to have to kind of actively probe if we don't want to, or that this information is available just once. And the only way to, to do it is to kind of go and speak to the network yet again. It should be storable in some way. And so we, we came up with effectively four potential solutions. There are many others, but we think these four mapped to those properties fairly well. And those are the ones we wanted to pay attention to. So two of those we talked about last time in, in, in this working group, uh, the DNS option. Um, there's one proposal for that. The proposal could be different, but the idea of using the DNS to advertise the capabilities of the, the origin or the authority or whatever the correct technical term is for this thing that you're about to connect to. We also talked about the setting, which would be uh, presented on the connection to the thing you're thinking that you're talking to. Um, and then there were other options that have been kind of passed around the mailing list here and there, such as using an ALPN, a new identifier to encode that information such that it could be invoked during things like handshaking or alt service discovery or other stuff. Um, and that's, that's a bit complicated, but we, what we didn't have there is any con kind of concrete write-up proposal, which makes talking about it difficult. And so in one of the later slides, I've got some cons on what ALPN is like downsides to that approach. Um, and that's maybe reflective of one sort of solution and a different solution doesn't have that. And that's taken out of the slides and the vision that will go in the data tracker. because it's not fair to the, the proposal space. And if someone could have the cycles to think more on that, maybe, maybe this would be a solution we consider. But uh, whatever. Uh, and then options, kind of feature discovery for the server you're actively connected to, which is general HTTP feature discovery, which we don't have a solution for anyway. So those are the only four we considered against our set of um, properties of the solution. And we did some nice, you know, give them numbers and rank them and do this and times by two for must and one by nice and whatever. And no matter kind of what we did, uh, this was the, the result that we had that um, you can look at the numbers. They don't mean anything really, they're, they're arbitrary. But kind of the analysis of that is that Kazuo, Would you like me to go back? Sorry, I just wanted to point out that the numbers look uh, the opposite for DNS and settings. Huh? I mean, I, I think if you calculate the sum, DNS is 29 and settings is 38. Uh, I, might, I might have, uh, yeah, I, I tried to transpose things. You've, yeah, that's another tweak we'll make before we post these to the data tracker. Thank you. 
just keeping you on your toes. Um, what's, what's good is the results analysis is the correct bit. So, uh, so, so from our findings, options had a, it was a clear negative outlier. Martin? If, if Kazuo is right, DNS is not on top. Okay, well, with, with, no, no, I, I did want to say one thing. Um, that it's not about whether or not you get your slides. Math is hard. Um, but the, um, the, the conclusion that we've reached in other contexts is that DNS is, is very good as a sort of hinting mechanism, but it is not very good as a means of establishing sort of authority about the status of a server. Yes, and, and that's something to think about when you when you go through all of these things. It's not something that's really reflected in your um, sort of metrics for this one, but it's something that, that I think underpins a lot of the decision making that we have here. Yeah, and that, that probably I should have put that on early in the slide. This is all about hinting and, and trying to make things better. The, the only the ultimate result is the response code you get when you try this thing out, and and that's about as best we can do. We can put lots of stuff in in anywhere and. Uh, no matter how strong we say the hint is, it could still fail. And the client's still going to have to deal with that. And it can already do those things today. Um, so anyway, back to this. We wanted to discount options. We don't want to spend too much time on that. DNS was on the top. There wasn't much delta between those things. Is that in within a margin of error or not? Let's try and explore some of the cons, some of the practical deployment considerations that these things have um, amongst the people in the, in the design team and other, others in the working group might not. And if so, come and come discuss. Um, so some of the constraints is that, you know, DNS, if you're gonna put something in new record types or new options that you know, not all clients can access that today. Um, that's something maybe we're trying to gravitate towards um, and that within the timeline of what we're trying to achieve, maybe the problem will just go away. But that's not just, I can support accessing the, or querying these record types in because of a library dependency. There's, there's other work that's going on, like privacy proxies, where the separation of concerns from the connection that's being made um, and the thing that's doing the DNS query could mean that we don't today have an ability to pass back some of the hints that we would like to put in the DNS. And that's probably a technically solvable challenge, but it would be a creation of a dependency of some work that we, we don't have. And I don't know if anyone's trying to solve that problem yet today. We've seen some of this with Tommy's next hop alias proxy draft uh, or spec, um, or returning pieces of information, but we were careful not to kind of make it DNS over HTTP headers. But maybe what we're seeing from this and, and other stuff is that that solution is, is maybe desirable for different kinds of use cases. Alex? Can we leave the queue to the end because we are very time constrained. Okay, okay. Yeah. Let, me, let me just rattle through. Yeah. Um, yeah uh, so, so the other option is settings. This applies to a connection that the server would say, uh, yes, I support extended connect. And yes, I support uh, web sockets using that extended connect method on this version of HTTP that I'm using. But when I was in the shower one day, I thought of an edge case that happens here because the setting applies to a connection and we want to do more connection coalescing <coughs> where the properties of those things um, may vary because we're trying to coalesce uh, as a vendor, you can support multiple different domains and administrative domains who want to configure things differently. And if we tell people that they can coalesce using the mechanisms that we have already, or the things like certificate frame that we're going to talk about later in the week, you end up in a, 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 a edge cases that I think could happen where somebody never wants to enable WebSockets over HTTP2, and somebody always does, and, and we just we're back to where we are today. Um, so I think that's, to me, that's kind of bad. Um, there could be a way to redefine new settings that are origin scoped. Uh, and maybe that's something we need to think about as coalescing gets better. I don't know. Um, again, there's that. And the LPN option, we didn't have a concrete proposal, like I've already said. Uh, it's, it's unclear if it can help with this selection between H2 and H3, right? You can do it with advertising a list of things. I spoke H1 and H2 and H2 WebSockets and have the server just use ALPN as it normally would to select the most preferential. But if you're trying to do something like that by putting ALPN values into alt service headers or ALPN values into the DNS, you kind of 
maybe don't get those benefits anyway because the head is broken and the DNS is, can lie and the DNS is a different option if we encode the same information in a different way. Um, and that's it. So we don't want to do everything because it's complex, it builds things. There's no perfect solution here. I think we, we, we clearly can't find something that's just going to work and everyone is going to enjoy it. Um, it is about trying to create a hint that helps. And if we can't do that in a way that can be done timely and pragmatic, personally, I don't think we, sh we can do anything. So the, 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 the direction is that uh, DNS has some snags today. It, it could, those could be resolved. It's a decent way to, to hint things. It's already being used to hint things like uh, HTTP version support that then you need to go off and try and create a connection to that thing. And then you learn it didn't work and then you have fallback mechanisms. Um, and so closing thought that while settings might ease that pain today, I don't, I think the issues with coalescing uh, are kind of intractable for me, unless people can clearly tell me I'm wrong, and that would be fine. Um, so this is a summary, which I've just summarized. Uh, that's, that's, that's it. Our next steps are really, you know, do you want to accept the kind of recommendations or the findings that came out of this group? Um, and can we, can we wind down the design team and move the discussion just back into the working group? Okay. Thank you. Um, so we already have a fairly substantial queue. We have one more topic that we'd like to get to after this. I don't know if that's going to be possible. But even with the queue we have, um, please be brief and to the point, and we will be closing the queue very soon. Hi, Alex Shanhofsky, Google. Um, I'm going to start by saying thank you to the design team for all the work that you've done. And I'm sorry that I'm about to dissent and say that I don't think that DNS is the right way to do this. I mostly wanted to ask if we had actually considered a alternative I don't see on there at all which is maybe we should be adding another field to the TLS handshake, sort of similar to ALPN, where we can declare which features the client wants. Because the thing that I really see here is that we have a problem with the hinting mechanism because it's really, really unfortunate that we don't have a consistent baseline of features between HTTP versions. And what we really want to have happen here is a semantic that without having to go to fallbacks, if possible, you get the right answer on the connection. And if you could imagine a world where you say ALPN H1, H2, required feature WebSockets. The server can say, well, I don't support WebSockets on H2, therefore I'm going to choose H1. And that's not really something that you can really express in the DNS hinting mechanism because you might not necessarily have uniform backends, even though your front end server might support everything. So I feel like there is a combinatorial thing here that can't be expressed. So if we don't believe in adding like an H2.1 ALPN that changes the baseline, maybe we should be bringing more settings frame information to the handshake because I really don't like the fallback mechanism that we have here. Thanks. Ben Schwartz, Meta. Uh, so uh, as as uh, uh, IANA expert for the service bindings registry, um, you know, I, th I think something like this certainly can be put into those records. But personally, I think the right solution here is not a technical solution. It's, it's a, an RFC that says HTTP is version independent because the, the idea that you have services that exist only in certain HTTP versions on your origin, but you have <clears throat> URIs that specify them that are version independent is a, a huge tangle. And uh, we don't have to come up with a technical solution for every problem. We also are empowered to tell people the right way to use the systems that we've built. In this case, the right way to use these systems is to offer the same things across all the versions of HTTP that you operate. And if you're in a state where that's not true, that's okay, we can tolerate that, but we should treat it as a transient state that's, that's not, the, not the target state. And instead of trying to optimize that, we should encourage people to get out of that state. Thanks. David Benjamin, uh, strong agreement with what Ben said. Basically, all of this comes from us having the wrong baseline. Um, I wanted to point out though, so the ALPN thing, so, so doing something like ALPN is the only thing that will solve H1 and H2 because that is where the decision is being made. Um, it actually, the DNS thing actually won't work at least the way all, uh, service B, HPS and service B are currently written. Um, we put a lot of effort, there was a lot of time spent on the service B alt service stuff to make sure that DNS is not allowed to downgrade the HP version selection. And so when you say H2 in DNS, it actually means the whole family of HP 
protocols that like share that entry point up until like TLS or whatever. Um, and so by the like current text in the service B draft, like you saying H2 and H1 are basically equivalent and there is no like consideration for you to like further filter it. And if we add that, then this means DNS, something non-authoritative is allowed to downgrade the protocol that you select, which will introduce other problems. Should we like ever add new protocols that run over the same transport, like an H4 that runs over quick V1 or something like that. Um, so like, we should treat this as a transient mistake that we made when we defined H2 and H3 that we didn't set the baseline right. We can choose how to get out of this transient issue by like either defining H2.1 or just to saying this was a mistake or deciding WebSockets is not worth the time. I don't know, but like I think the current situation, the current, the, the proposed solution is mostly going to add problems rather than solving them. Watson Lab, Akamai, uh, I just had a strong sense of deja vu in this conversation. It felt very much like <clears throat> what you have when you're trying to advertise H3 or H2, and obviously there's some differences, but it seems like you, the same kind of panoply of solutions come up and the same kinds of, of drives like have an output, but that's not good enough. We want to put it in DNS to be faster. We want to remember. So I think there's, there's just this very strong sense of which those are are connected and we probably don't want to go through the whole wheel twice. All right, Eric, can you hear Apple? So one of the, the challenges that we have when talking about selecting between H2 and H3 is that by the time you're doing AOPN or anything after that, it's a little bit late. Um, so that's a, a bit of a challenge. Uh, I think the, the point made earlier about this is, this is purely a hint is a good one, which is people already are doing this today. People are already choosing today. People already get it wrong, a arguably very, very small percentage of the time. Um, it might be interesting to even look at data for how often we guess wrong, um, because it may be that this is actually a non-issue. OK, was that helpful, Lucas? Mm, it's unsurprising. Um, I, I, would, I, I would respond to some points, but I'm, I'm, we're short on time. I think, I mean, for me, the second point's answered that I, the, 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 the questions or feedback here cannot be answered by the design team that mm. we had. And if we were to, to create another design team and have more people, I'm not convinced we would be able to have the resource or the time to come up with that, it, it, that we couldn't just do in a working group as, as just our normal mode of work. Okay. And I think the first question is a clear no. <laughs> so, 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 um, so yeah, I, I would ask, the working group to, to come up with um, some clearer now, like, should we even do this? And if so, again, yet again, back to considering the different options. But it, to me, it's been a very valuable process. So again, thanks for everyone involved and, and the feedback. Likewise, I think just getting a little more clarity and a little more discussion is, is, is always a good thing. So thank you. Okay, um, Shivan, unfortunately, I don't think we have time to get to your presentation. Uh, we will try to uh, fit that in tomorrow in our other session. Um, so I think we're done for today. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Jonathan, for taking minutes. And hopefully we'll see you tomorrow. See you tomorrow, everyone.